the uh, quotation that we have most often used in connection with natural obedience and this type of thing is found in the book Steps to Christ. If we abide in Christ, if the love of God dwells in us, our feelings, our thoughts, our purposes, our actions will be in harmony with the will of God. This evening we'd like to take a little longer look at our usage of the term abide and what is meant by that. And right to begin with, I'd like to suggest that it must include something more than joining the church and remember remaining a, quotes, a faithful member, dues-paying member the rest of our lives. I'd like to leave that one clear out for the moment because of the easy tendency for people either who were born in the church or... Uh, have rested upon that as their security and to rather go into the deeper experience of two other aspects. Now, when we go to the scriptures on this subject, we don't find a great array of texts using the term abide or abiding. In fact, I'm going to list most all of them in the entire Bible in the next few moments, and uh, along with it, give the intent, evidently, of the context and the word meaning. Uh, try to do a little word study on this in the scripture. In Genesis 22, verse 5, abide or abiding has the meaning of uh, to stay or tarry. In Genesis, the 29th chapter, verse 19, and Psalm 15, verse 1, the term abide suggests to dwell or live with. In John 14, verse 16, and Ecclesiastes 8, verse 15, the word suggests to continue or remain. In Proverbs 19, verse 23, it suggests the idea of rest, abide or rest. And that's interesting, Hebrews 4 rest from our own works. Psalm 91, verse 1, a well-known psalm that we often quote, He that dwelleth in the secret place of the Most High shall abide under the shadow of the Almighty, or remain, or stay, or tarry, or dwell, or live with, or continue, or remain. Luke 19, verse 5, two men on the road to Emmaus, they invited the stranger to abide at their house or to stay. I'm sorry, that was Luke 24, verse 29. Luke 19, verse 5, Jesus told Zacchaeus that uh, he wanted to abide or stay at his house. 1 John 2, 27 and 28, the idea is to live, to remain permanently, never to depart. You also have the same usage in 1 John 2.6 and in 1 John 3.6 to live and remain in communion with and in obedience to. You have the word abide showing up in 1 John 3.24 and also in John 5.38. Probably the most pronounced treatment of this word is in Jesus' statement in the upper room just before his crucifixion. Remember that uh, Jesus talked to his disciples in the upper room all the way through John 14 to John 17. So all of those chapters have to do with the upper room discourse at the Last Supper. And here he brings into light the thing of the vine and the branches, abide in me and I in you. As a branch cannot bear fruit, unless it abide in the vine, no more can ye, unless ye abide in me. Well, as you study the uh, word and its usage in Scripture, you cannot help but come away with this idea of staying with, or remaining, continuing, 
hopefully never to depart. And this suggests something else. If Jesus invites us to abide with him, this means there must have been an initial beginning. How can you stay with someone you haven't already started with? So the abiding invitation suggests an experience that has already begun. And it also stresses the importance of continuation of that experience, which is very significant in the Christian life. We've noticed that again and again. It isn't just a one-time thing. Repentance isn't even a one-time thing. It's a continuing thing. Conversion isn't a one-time thing. It's continuing, remaining, staying in this relationship. Of course, this is a concept that much of the evangelical world doesn't really make a whole lot of. And there are many among us today who are fearful that uh, we're going to add something to the gospel if we stress this too much. The proper balance between beginning and continuing is a fine line, but both are very important, are they not? Now, when you go to the uh, Spirit of Prophecy and take a look in the index for the 20 pages on abiding, you discover that there's one little reference. And it uh, refers you to Steps to Christ, page 69 to 71, which led me to believe that the index is not inspired. Now, of course, I may have missed some other synonyms in the process of looking in the index. There might be a great section on this if I knew what to look for. But the actual wording, abiding, only one reference. There are many more than that uh, for the novice who has read it all in the Spirit of Prophecy. I'd like to just point you to the two main ones that rise to the top. First of all, in Steps to Christ, page 71. We're going to go backwards. Page 71. Jesus says, abide in me. These words convey the idea of rest, stability, and confidence. Rest, again. Confidence, trust. All right, steps to Christ, page 69. Apart from him, you have no life. You have no power to resist temptation or to grow in grace and holiness. Abiding in him, you may flourish. It is by communion with him daily, hourly, by abiding in him that we are to grow in grace. Could it be that one of the things that we have a hard time learning is to commune with him more than just that devotional time set apart? Maybe one of the hardest things for us to learn is to commune with him hourly, whatever that means, and continually. Perhaps this is the area where growth takes place. Page 62. After we've been assured of the forgiveness of sins and that we are accepted before God just as if we had never sinned when we first come to him, then we are told, more than this, here you have the two aspects again, the initial experience, coming to him, but then more than this, Christ changes the heart. He abides in your heart by faith. You are to maintain this connection with Christ by faith and the continual surrender of your will to him. And so long as you do this, interesting phrase, so long as you do this, he will work in you to will and to do according to his good pleasure. So long as you do what? Maintain the connection with Christ by faith and the continual surrender of your will 
to him. All right, there we have two parts, by faith and a continual surrender of your will to him. By faith has something to do with our part. The continual surrender of our will to him has something to do with his part because we've noticed earlier that we cannot empty ourselves of self. Only Christ can do that part. And one more, page 61 in Steps to Christ. I'm sorry, this is the one we already read. Might as well read it again. If we abide in Christ, if the love of God dwells in us, our feelings, thoughts, purposes, and actions will be in harmony with the will of God. All right, now just a few sentences like that from the other major contribution, Desire of Ages 675. And then we'll try and notice an application in our lives in a practical sense. This starts out in his comment to the disciples in the upper room with the underscoring of the fact that Christ in his humanity was dependent upon divine power. We've been noticing how Christ lived in dependence upon divine power because he said, I can of my own self do nothing. And in John 17, verse 23, remember, Jesus in his prayer prayed that we might be perfect in one and he used these words speaking to his Father, I in them and thou in me. I in them, thou in me. So the same relationship that Jesus had of his Father and him in close connection is possible and available to us in relationship to Christ. Now, how is this union begun? By faith in him as a personal savior, the union is formed. Desire of Ages 675. Page 676. This union with Christ, once formed, must be maintained. This is no casual touch, no off and on connection. It's not off and on. And that's an interesting phrase. The life you have received from me can be preserved only by continual communion. Without me, you cannot overcome one sin or resist one temptation. And then it says, the life of the vine, and who is the vine, by the way? Who is the vine? John 15, Jesus said, I am the vine, ye are the what? Branches, all right? The life of the vine will be manifest in fragrant fruit on the branches. Now, is the fruit from the branches or from the vine? The life of the vine will be manifest in fragrant fruit on the branches. Is it the fruit of the vine or the fruit of the branches? You're split right down the center. Ponder that one for a little bit. Here's another sentence. When we live by faith on the Son of God, the fruits of the Spirit will be seen in our life. Not one will be missing. Isn't that interesting? Amen. However, same page, there may be an apparent connection with Christ without a real union with him by faith. Even as the graft can be outwardly united with the vine, but no vital connection. A profession of religion places men in the church. It's talking about that thing, abiding in the church. There has to be something far more than abiding in the church. This was a problem in the days of Christ. They thought that uh, because they belonged to the right group, that they were secure. Never was there anything farther from the truth. Is that truth? Never farther from the truth. 
There's no such thing as righteousness by denomination. <laughs> and then on page 677, something else very interesting. The Savior does not bid the disciples labor to bear fruit. You'd expect me to pick that one out. Got to read it again. The Savior does not bid the disciples labor to bear fruit. He tells them to abide in Him. What happens? When you abide in Him, you don't have to labor to bear fruit. The fruit comes. Natural. And then it gives us a clue as to how we abide. It is through the Word that Christ abides in His followers. How much abiding has He been allowed to do in your life this week? Sort of in proportion to meaningful involvement in His Word, right? The life of Christ in you produces the same fruits as it did as in him. The life of Christ in you produces the same fruits as in him. Now I have two or three little short comments that give us a little wider picture as to how this connection is maintained. Ministry of Healing 182, by prayer, by the study of his word, by faith in his abiding presence, the weakest of human beings may live in contact with the living Christ. Volume 5, page 113, those who will put on the whole armor of God and devote some time every day to meditation and prayer to the study of the scriptures will be connected with heaven. Steps to Christ, page 101, through sincere prayer, we are brought into connection with the mind of the infinite. Volume 5, page 48. It is only by personal union with Christ, by communion with him daily, hourly, that we can bear the fruits of the Holy Spirit. Christ Object Lessons 421. To his faithful followers, Christ has been a daily companion and a familiar friend. A daily companion and a familiar friend. They have lived in close contact, in constant communion with God. Constant communion. Prayer, unceasing prayer, is the unbroken union of the soul with God. Steps to Christ 98. Have you ever wondered... What this unceasing prayer is, some of us have gotten really worried about that, thinking that we'd have to be praying all the time. Words, verbalizing. There is a practical definition right there. It isn't necessarily mouthing words all the time. It's unbroken union of the soul with God. And you'll find, if you study it carefully, that to pray in the name of Jesus is to do the same thing. To pray in the name of Jesus is something more than mouthing his name during the prayer. It is to pray from the stance of unbroken union of the soul with God. That's what it means to pray in the name of Jesus. And only the one who has that unbroken union of the soul with God is really praying in the name of Jesus. It is through the word that Christ abides in his followers. The words of Christ are spirit and life. Receiving them, you live the life of the branch in the vine. And once more, except to Christ 69, it is by communion with him daily, hourly, by abiding in him that we are to grow in Christ. Now I have one more so long as statement, and then we will uh, put it together. Not even by a thought did Jesus yield to temptation. So it may be with us. How do you like the sound of that? Does that make you chew your fingernails, though? Not even by a thought did he yield to temptation. So it may be with us. Christ's humanity was united to divinity. He was fitted for the conflict by the indwelling of the Holy Spirit. And he came to make us partakers of the divine nature. So long as we are united to him by faith, sin has no more dominion over us. Desire of Ages 1, 2, 3. 
So long as we are united to him by faith, sin has no more dominion over us. Well, with this background in mind, then, let's go back to our circle. Someone said that we shouldn't have started the... uh, line in the middle, we should go on down here to where we are, and uh, out here somewhere is the devil, and he's constantly trying to distract our attention to him. We have earlier diagrammed this, that this vertical line represents the essence of the word abiding. The reason we have taken that position is because in its usage in both Bible and spirit of prophecy, the abiding carries with it absolute victory. Now, we all know from the concept of beginning Christianity and growing in grace, that even though we have a daily relationship with God, we still can fall and fail. So if the predominance of the use of the word abiding carries with it the idea of absolute victory, there must be something more than just the daily relationship of communion with God suggested by the devotional life. You recall that this large circle has as its ingredients Bible study and prayer and service or sharing. We have already thrown out the idea of abiding in the church as being insufficient by itself. We're talking here about the organic church. There must be at least the next step for the vibrant, genuine Christian, abiding in daily communion. The circle again. The faith relationship. And this abiding must not be on again, off again, as we noticed. But we have noticed earlier that this kind of abiding, the third and the most pronounced kind of abiding, is on again, off again in the growing Christian life. That's why we fail. We've also noticed that God has made provision with his two reservoirs of grace, power and forgiveness, so that even though we might be broken in our dependence upon his power, we are not broken in our ongoing certainty of salvation. So in its purest sense, in its ultimate sense, I hope that uh, it is plain why we use the term abiding to apply to this absolute dependence upon his strength instead of depending on ourselves. The circle, once more, represents the faith relationship. The vertical versus the horizontal represents the surrendered stance or the unsurrendered stance. Or by that we mean depending upon God's power versus depending on ourselves and our own strength. Now, we left off last week with the suggestion that uh, we had talked last week about the question of how to handle temptations. Temptations, plural. And uh, we wanted to mention just briefly, and uh, that's all it's going to be this week, the idea of temptation singular. You recall the difference? 
Temptations, plural, are to do bad things, to break God's law. Temptation, singular, is to live a life apart from God. Jesus was constantly plagued by the devil to give in to temptation, singular, to not depend upon his father's power, instead to go it alone, do it himself. He never once gave in to that, but maintained this constant daily relationship and also maintained the constant dependence upon his father's power. Never deviated from it. Because he maintained this constant dependence on his father's power, sins or temptations had no dominion over him. He was repulsed by sins. They did not appeal to him. And, of course, the fascinating thing is that we have the same privilege offered to us. As we learn to depend constantly upon his power, sins are repulsive to us too. They have no dominion over us. Satan cannot touch us with sins or temptations. Victory is given us. Is given us. Well, this was the thrust of our emphasis last week. That uh, in handling temptations, if our communion and our dependence upon God's power is existent previous to temptations, we don't give in to temptations. And that's where the victory is won. Long before the temptations ever come, we have, by God's grace and our own diligent effort, have maintained the victory over temptation. Singular, or the tendency to want to do it alone. I was tempted to bring in a long sheath of um, quotations about our need for grit and determination and willpower and discipline and effort and backbone in the area of temptation tonight. Because some feel we've neglected those. Those, as far as we're concerned, are dealing all with the area of temptation. Singular. And here is where we're invited to put forth the most strenuous efforts to keep from depending upon ourselves. And God will meet us more than halfway in that effort. I've uh, compromised and brought along one. Doesn't sound like a compromise, does it? Volume 5, page 47. Read the whole section, it's good. Union with Christ is to be formed by those who are naturally at enmity with him. It is a relation of utter dependence to be entered into by a proud heart. This is a close work, and many who profess to be followers of Christ know nothing of it. After this union is formed, what would it be here? Union with Christ. All right? After this union is formed, it can be preserved only by continual, earnest, painstaking effort. Christ exercises his power to preserve and guard this sacred tie. Is Christ still in it? Yes, he is. But... The dependent, helpless sinner must act his part with untiring energy. Or Satan, by his cruel, cunning power, will separate him from Christ. I don't know if you've caught this difference before. I hope so, but some haven't. And this has become confusing. Reading some statements that sound like it's natural and other statements sound like real effort. Please, catch the difference once more tonight. Catch the difference. We're not talking about untiring, painstaking effort. We're not talking about um, the untiring energy 
toward fighting the devil or toward fighting our sins or toward fighting our weaknesses. We are talking about untiring, painstaking, earnest effort with untiring energy toward preserving the union and communion with Christ day by day. Do you catch the difference? The very thing that many Christians are not doing, and instead they're wasting their time and effort trying to fight the devil and uh, their sins and their weaknesses. Now, it really bothers me when uh, someone comes along and says, yeah, we, uh, we got your message. Uh, there's nothing we need to do. We don't have anything to do. Christ does it all. No, that is not the message. That is not the message. Christ does it all in fighting Satan. We're not big enough to even touch him. But Christ does not do it all in this communion and union with him. This is our part to be followed with painstaking, untiring energy. And demands every ounce of willpower and self-discipline that we know. And I do not think that that is natural. Any more than it is natural for me to come home at night after I've been talking with people all day and my wife says, tell me what happened today. And that's the last thing in the world I want to do. I put my head back in a pillow and slip into a coma. <laughs> You'll have often times in your Christian life when you don't feel like reading the Bible. You don't feel like praying. Don't expect that to always be natural. Am I exaggerating? There are some who want to hold out for that and they say, well, I'm not going to do it until it comes natural. No, no, we're not talking about natural communion and union with Christ. There are times when it's the very thing that uh, you cannot help doing. There are other times when it takes every ounce of discipline and willpower you know to keep Satan from intervening and breaking that daily communion contact fellowship with Christ. Well, we tried once more. I hope that difference stands out. And that is how we fight temptation. Christ meets us more than halfway. You can take the weakest person in the world, the weakest person in the world, if you'll put out whatever willpower and energy he has, be it ever so small, toward seeking Christ, Christ will meet him wherever he needs to meet him. But it requires whatever that weakest person in the world has to put out, because God cannot seek himself for us. Dear Lord, we pray that you'll help us to abide in something more than the church membership. We pray that you'll help us to abide in that daily relationship. More than that, help us to abide in the fullest sense, totally upon your power. Save us from dependence upon our own strength. We cry to you because of our need. In Jesus' name, amen. You have been listening to another special American Christian Ministries presentation. This recording has been digitally reprocessed from the original audio cassette or reel-to-reel -reel in order to make this CD available. The audio quality was improved as much as possible. International copyright, American Christian Ministries. All rights reserved. To order a copy of this or other presentations or for a free catalog, please call toll-free 800-233-4450. International calls dial 717-652-7000. You may also order from our secure website at www.americanchristianministries.org. There you will discover the largest selection of authentic Adventist preaching available. American Christian Ministries is not a one-man band. It is an orchestra of outstanding speakers who are all on the same theological page. If American Christian Ministries has been a blessing to you, why not take a moment just now and send us a note or an email with your testimony? We'll share it with our speakers and volunteer workers to encourage them. Your prayers and continued financial support are very important to ensure the continuation of this ministry as we help prepare America and the world to meet Jesus Christ. He's coming soon.